Welcome to FOSS North, the virtual edition. We would like to thank all our sponsors and partners in this difficult situation. Our gold sponsors, Luxoft and Ansible by Red Hat. Our silver sponsors, ITRS Group and Make It Right. Our base sponsors. Our partner projects, the open source community and the region of Gothenburg. And a huge thanks to our awesome community. This would not have been possible without you. Welcome back. So next up is Drew, uh, who will talk about RISC-V and running Linux on it. Uh, the stage is yours, Drew. Hello, my name is Drew Pistini. I wanted to talk today about uh, two things I'm quite excited about, which is Linux and RISC-V. Specifically, talking about running it on open source hardware and with uh, open source FPGA tools. Um, so, just a little bit about me. I'm um, sad I've not been to Foss North before, uh, so maybe next year I'll get there in person. But it's great to do it online um, uh, during the day, so to speak. I'm a hardware designer at a PCB manufacturing service in the U.S. Um, and then I volunteer on the board of directors for the Beagle Bordeaux Foundation. We make uh, small open hardware Linux computers. Um, and I'm also part of the Open Source Hardware Association. Um, and if you haven't heard of us before, we have actually a, um, a nice way to certify your projects if you're building something that's open source hardware. So you can find out more information about that at certification.ashwa.org. Um, so if you've not heard of the term before, um, open source hardware is hardware whose design is made publicly available so that anyone can study modify, distribute, make, and sell the design or hardware based on that design. Um, so I mostly do electronics. So for an electronics project, um, the documentation for an open source hardware project would include the schematics, the board layout, um, and the bill materials. And for the schematics and the board layouts, um, it would be important to share the editable source files. So I use a program called KiCad, so I'd be sharing the KiCad files, or if you use Eagle or Altium, you'd be sharing the um, uh, files from your CAD program. The reason for that is if you want um, other people to be able to collaborate on the development, then it's best for them to have the original CAD files. Um, additionally, um, you want to publish your bill of materials so that people can actually build um, uh, the project based on the parts list. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is um, if you want other people to be able to build your project, make sure that they can source the parts in low quantity. I go more into open source hardware um, in this um, CCC talk that I gave um, at the last Congress. Um, so there's a link in the slides. And on the next slide here, I'll have a link again. Um, there's a PDF on a, in a GitHub repo with the links to, um, with links to a bunch of the different stuff in the presentation. Because um, a lot of these are going to have links in these slides. So if you want to find out more, you can click on the link. Um, so risk five, let's talk about that. Um, so when you write a, a C or C++ program, um, it gets compiled into instructions for the microprocessor or the CPU to execute. But how does the compiler know what instructions the CPU understands? This is defined by the instruction set architecture or the ISA. Um, so an ISA is a standard. It's a set of rules that define the tasks that the processor can run. So you've probably heard of um, x86, such as Intel or AMD um, or ARM. So if probably your laptop or um, your desktop or most servers are um, x86 based, so they have an Intel or AMD processor, um, they're using the x86 instruction set, or um, your smartphone definitely has an ARM in it. So that's a processor that's implementing the ARM instruction set. However, both of these are proprietary and need commercial licensing if you want to be able to use them. Um, in the case of x86, only a few companies are even able to, to use it. In the case of ARM, you have to um, license it from ARM. So about 10 years ago, some researchers that were doing um, computer architecture research at the University of California, Berkeley, um, wanted to um, have an ISA that they could use for doing their research. Um, and they didn't want to bother with having to um, license the commercial ISA, like um, the ARM instruction set. Um, so they created um, RISC-V. So it's called RISC-V because it's the fifth RISC instruction set to come out of Berkeley. Um, Berkeley was involved in creating the original um, RISC instruction set back in the early 80s. Um, so RISC-V is a, it's a new instruction set um, that um, is free and open for anyone to be able to use. 
Um, and I believe it's licensed under the Creative, Com uh, Creative Commons share like license. Um, if you wanna find out more about the instruction set, I'm, it's a pretty brief uh, presentation here, um, but two great talks that I recommend. One is instruction sets want to be free, um, which is from David Patterson, um, who's one of the people that actually co-created RISC back in the early 80s, and he's been involved with RISC-V. Um, and then uh, Kirst Asanovich, um, who's uh, the professor that kind of spearheaded the um, RISC-V project. Um, in every, probably like maybe once or twice a year, he gives the State of the Union of RISC-V. Um, so if you just punch that into YouTube, you'll find the latest one, or you can, you can um, pull up the link there. So this is a curse uh, talk that he gives um, uh, kind of once or twice a year called the State of the Union. Um, and I'm just gonna pull some slides in from that to give you a, a good idea. So um, one of the ideas behind RISC-5 is that it's a simple instruction set um, that they took all the knowledge they had over several decades of designing risk instruction sets um, to kind of make the best one. The idea too behind RISC-5 is that it's modular. Um, so the idea is it's gonna scale from tiny little 32-bit uh, microcontrollers all the way up to supercomputers. So um, something that's modular and extensible. So there's a small base and then there's extensions that allow you to add in additional functionality. Um, the other thing that's important too is the base, which is frozen now, means that if you compile a program for the RISC-V base instruction set, it'll continue to work even if you have some new fancy uh, processor like 20 years from now. Uh, just to give you a sense of the timeline here, it started about 10 years ago, um, and then they've been doing some, some tape outs of um, uh, research chips along the way, and then at some point uh, companies got involved like Western Digital and NVIDIA. Um, and the other really important thing I think when it comes to RISC-V, um, it's not the first open instruction set, but it's really gained critical mass. So there's support in Linux and GCC and Clang, a um, bunch of different real-time operating systems. Um, so there's the support there when it comes to the software side of things. There's also several um, open source implementations of it. So um, the ISA itself is just a standard of what instructions can be run on the processor. And then there's an implementation of that instruction set. So there's several open source implementations that are out there. Um, Rocket and Boom are from Berkeley. Um, Risky and Arian are from ETH Zurich. Um, and then there's also companies like Western Digital um, has one called Swerve that they've contributed as well. So both universities and companies are creating open implementations. Um, though I should note that um, while the instruction set is open, there can be both open source implementations and proprietary implementations. So just because it says RISC-V doesn't mean that the design of the processor is open. It just means that it's implementing the open uh, instruction set. So to give you a sense here of what is the base ISA for RISC-V, so the, the base ISA is just 32-bit fixed width in integer. Um, so that's all you need to have to be considered RISC-V is just this base ISA. Um, and to give you a sense here, um, uh, this is all the instructions um, for the base uh, ISA, which is referred to as RV RISC-V 32 is 32-bit and then I for integer. Um, so uh, if you have used ARM or um, x86 especially, um, you'll notice there's a lot more instructions in this. So this is a pretty small subset here, which is the idea here is that RISC-V is simple and the base is very small and then it can be extended um, as needed for different use cases. Um, and from David Patterson's talk, he has this, um, what's called the green card here, which was back in the day when people do machine coding, they would have the list of all the different instructions for the instruction set. Um, and the idea here is that you can represent the whole uh, um, breadth of RISC-V with just this little card here. So this covers everything from 32-bit, um, 64-bit, even 128-bit. Uh, now, we, we don't have 120 bits of memory yet, but the idea is in the future it might be useful, um, especially for security. Um, the 128-bit um, has some benefits there, so there's already some people that are experimenting with it. Um, when you look at RISC-V architectures, you see all these letters and it can get, get kind of confusing. Um, M is for multiply, um, A is for atomic, F is for float, D is for double float, um, and then C is for compressed. So you'll see a mix of those depending on what features the, it um, implements. Um, and you can always go back to these talks if you want to learn more about um, the RISC-V ISA. So let's talk about who's using RISC-V. So 
Um, as I said before, the idea here was to have an instruction set that would uh, be extensible from everything from a small little microcontroller all the way up to a supercomputer. And all these things are being done right now with RISC-V. Um, while it was created at Berkeley, um, the RISC-V uh, standard is now maintained by the RISC-V Foundation at RISC-V.org. Uh, RISC um, there's over 400 members, including companies and universities and more. Um, and one of the things that's really helped me is they have these, um, used to be called RISC-5 Workshop, now the RISC-5 Summit, um, once or twice a year. Um, and all the talks are up on YouTube. So if you want to find out more, it's a great place to look. Um, and companies like NVIDIA and Western Digital um, are looking to ship millions of devices. So for example, Western Digital decided that they were going to um, take all the little controllers that are in their disk drives and move them over from architectures like ARM over to RISC-V. Um, NVIDIA also is replacing uh, a controller in their, in their GPU with a RISC-V based controller. Not the thing that does the heavy lifting, but just something that coordinates and, and manages the, the hardware. Um, and part of this is to avoid ARM licensing fees. So if you're making a billion devices that can add up, um, but more importantly um, is it gives them the freedom to um, leverage open source implementations, um, like ones from Berkeley um, and ETH Zurich, um, and also gives them the ability to uh, implement their own microarchitecture um, the best way for their own products. Um, so with ARM, only a few companies like Qualcomm and, and Apple have architecture licenses. Everyone else is just licensing specific cores. Um, so with uh, RISC-V, you, you have the liberty to do your own um, uh, microarchitecture micro implementation. And as I mentioned, the RISC-V Summit, um, it happens, uh, I think, once a year. Um, there's other events as well. So if you check out the RISC-V uh, YouTube channel, you can find a ton there. It's one of the ways I'm able to um, stay up with what's happening in the RISC-V community. Um, and one of the other things I think is interesting with RISC-V is um, it's something that we're seeing growth um, globally in. Um, so uh, one of the reasons I think is um, countries and nations uh, have an incentive, I think, to have technology that is developed um, uh, internally. So uh, nations such as India uh, have created initiatives to um, make their own processor designs based on RISC-V. And this way they can uh, mitigate the risk of depending on technology that's coming from another country like the US. Um, and something that happened last year was the US banned companies from doing business with Huawei, which is a, a large company, a very large company in China. Um, and for a while, it was uncertain if Huawei would be able to continue to use ARM or not. Um, currently, they are still able to use ARM, um, licensed ARM cores, but you have to imagine that this probably gave a, a good incentive for companies in China to look at alternatives and many of them are now um, implementing their own RISC-V designs. I should mention um, Alibaba, especially, is designing a server class uh, RISC-V chip. Uh, so if you want to learn, out, learn more about RISC-V, um, wrote a column in a recent Hackspace magazine. You can download that for free off the internet um, at that URL there. And the first time that I learned of RISC-V was uh, several years ago. Um, I came across this project called OnChip OpenV. So this was a completely open source um, design for a 32-bit microcontroller out of a university in Columbia. And the effort was called OnChip. Um, so this was really cool. They designed uh, the microcontroller, including the analog parts. And it was all open source uh, implementation of the RISC-V um, instruction set. Um, so that that's really cool, but you know I'm also interested in Linux. So what is out there that will allow us to run Linux on this spot? Um, so I was really excited when I saw Low Risk Form a few years ago. Um, it was created by a couple of people that were involved in in starting Raspberry Pi, and the aim here was to produce a SOC or system on chip that's capable of doing something like running a smartphone or um, making a basic single board computer around. You know, essentially a um, a uh, low cost um, in volume SOC that we could run Linux on. Um, they're still working on that, but um, in the meantime, they've also started doing some security work uh, with RISC-V and Google called Open Titan. Uh, Alex Bradbury, who's one of the people that was involved in a lot of the software stuff on the Raspberry Pi when it first started, um, and is one of the founders of Low Risk, he gave an interesting talk about the future of operating systems on RISC-V um, that is worth checking out there. Um, 
In addition, uh, while they haven't created a um, silicon chip yet, um, they're still developing um, this idea of the low risk SOC. Um, and there's information on this page here um, that you can go to in the link about how you can take their current release uh, and run it on a FPGA development board and get a full Linux um, graphical desktop environment. So one of the, so I'm part of the Open Source Hardware Association, and, um, which is mostly typically focused on um, like board level projects, um, but the kind of the complement there when it comes to chip design is FOSI, which is the Free and Open Source Silicon Foundation. Um, and the idea here is um, they kind of bring together a lot of the different organizations and people working in, in uh, RISC-V and open source chip design. Uh, and they have several conferences throughout the year, such as OrCOMP and, and LatchUp. Um, LatchUp is in the US and OrCOMP is in um, Europe. And then they do, sometimes they do these other one-off conferences as well. Uh, and uh, if you click on the link there, it'll take you to the FOSSE Foundation's website, or if you pull up FOSSE in YouTube, um, you can see all the different talks that have happened at their conferences. And one of the, one of the initiatives out of uh, FOSSE is a website called LibreCores. Um, so the idea here, you know, with, with source code, uh, many people will share their projects on GitHub, um, but there hasn't been a great place to go and find um, open source chip design. Um, on the internet, especially things that uh, have been proven that they, they work and you can reuse in your project. Um, so LibreCores is something that's trying to solve that problem. Um, it's still a pretty um, early effort, but I think uh, in the future, hopefully that'll be a place that you can go if you're designing your own chip and you need a USB controller or you need a SPI peripheral, you can go there and grab that and integrate it into your design. So one of the companies that's really heavily involved in RISC-V is called sci 5 and it's a startup that was formed by some of the researchers out of Berkeley. Um, and they were one of the first to come out with a um, commercially available uh, microcontroller. Um, and it's called the FE310. And they have this Arduino form factor board that they came out with a few years ago. Um, now this is really cool, um, but it is still just a microcontroller. So it has you know, a couple of kilobytes of memory um, it's not something that we can, unfortunately, it's not something we can run Linux, run Linux on. So let's talk about uh, what, what possible RISC-V chips are out there that we could run Linux on. Well, sci 5 also made a, a Pentacore 64-bit uh, RISC-V um, uh, system on chip um, called, the, uh, called the F Freedom Unleashed uh, uh, FU540. Um, and they came out with a board, um, I think about two years ago, um, which is really cool. It, it has, you know, four 64-bit RISC-V cores. Um, it's a really nice system. The, the only downside here is this is really just a, kind of an evaluation board, proof of concept. They only made, I think, less than a thousand and the board costs a thousand dollars. So um, it is probably the nicest board you can get right now if you wanted to run uh, Linux on RISC-V. However, it's not practical for most people. Um, however, I hit many people, plenty of places I've seen it are at people that are doing things like bringing up distros. Um, so for example, uh, there are people working on uh, a Fedora port for RISC-V. Um, and there's a good presentation here from someone from Red Hat um, about how they're doing that project. And they are actually leveraging that um, Sci-5 uh, Freedom Unleashed board. Um, along with a graphics card and some other uh, hardware to get a full uh, Linux desktop running. Um, so this is not practical for most people. It's a fairly expensive system, but this is what um, uh, some, some people are using to bring up distros right now for RISC-V. So in addition to that uh, real hardware solution with the uh, expensive sci-fi board and then some other expensive hardware um, to get a full desktop, the other thing that uh, people are using is just QEMU. So QEMU is a, um, uh, an emulator that allows you to do things like emulate ARM or RISC-V on your x86 um, desktop or server. Um, so the Fedora effort um, from the people at Red Hat, they're um, using both a combination of real hardware and also QEMU. Uh, and this is uh, kind of gives you a flavor here for, for how it works. Um, it's kind of the normal uh, flow that we'd expect just with um, Initial, the beginning there being um, something called Open SBI, um, and that's kind of you could think of it as the kind of basic initialization of the system, and that that'll go into U-boot, which is a fairly common uh, bootloader that you'll see on embedded um, boards. Uh, and then we jump into Linux, and then we 
do our normal uh, init RAM FS, and then we boot up into Fedora. And if you're a Debian fan, uh, Debian is also doing a port as well. So both Fedora and Debian have uh, working ports right now for RISC-V. So there's the Sci-5 Unleashed board. It's $1,000. It's not something that's generally available. Um, so it, what's something that we can actually get our hands on? So this little board here, it has a chip on it called the Kendrite K210. Um, so this um, is something that uh, an, an engineer from Western Digital, uh, Damien Lamal, had uh, worked on along with a couple other people last year to try and get it working. So the constraint here was it only has eight megabytes of, of RAM, so pretty limited environment. But uh, right now it's the only like thing that's generally available for running um, Linux on. So it's a dual core 64-bit RISC-V uh, core running at 400 megahertz with eight megabytes of SRAM, which is a lot of SRAM for a microcontroller, not a lot for a Linux system. Um, the cool thing is this board, you can buy the smaller one here for only $13. Um, it's made by a company called Cypede and you can get it from different places, including Seed Studio. Uh, and Damien, along with a couple other uh, Linux kernel hackers, they got Linux finally running on it. Um, and then probably about a month ago, um, kind of for a while, it was like this experimental thing that they hadn't really shared yet how to get it working. And then about a month ago, uh, kind of all came together. And now there's really clear instructions about how if you get one of these boards, you can go and load up and put uh, uh, RISC-V, uh, sorry, you can put Linux on it. And then you'll finally have a system running uh, Linux on RISC-V here. So here's an example of the, the board that I have. Uh, and just showing you there, uh, it's got two 64-bit um, cores, and we're, we can even run a, a little uh, C compiler on there uh, to write a uh, small program. So it's not particularly practical, but for right now, um, unless you really our options are using um, QEMU on you know, x86 hardware or having that really expensive sci-fi board um, or this smaller board. There is another option I'll get to very quickly which is FPGAs, but in terms of actual um, uh, hard chips or ASICs is another term for that. Um, these are our options right now. And uh, the version called the GoBoard, the Cyped Max GoBoard also has a little uh, Wi-Fi chip in it that someone's been trying to get working. Um, uh, it's connected through serial. So um, the goal there is that we'll eventually be able to have networking on this small system. And I think in the, in the reference um, image that you can download from here, I think you still have like something like four megabytes or six megabytes free. So um, there is some room there to do um, some interesting things, I think. Uh, though if we're gonna have something like a Raspberry Pi or a BeagleBone that's RISC-5, we really need a, um, uh, a system on chip that's made in volume um, that has external memory. So. Uh, the things that are coming up in 2020, uh, Microchip, uh, formerly MicroSemi, has this uh, Polar Fire SOC. So this is actually a hard RISC-V processor along with an FPGA. So if you've heard of the Xilinx Zinc, this is a similar situation where you have a hard uh, silicon processor, and then you also have an FPGA fabric alongside of it. However, because it's an FPGA, it's going to be, I think, more expensive than uh, your typical sort of uh, system on chip. Uh, so That'll be one option, um, but I think it'll be relatively expensive for people that are used to things like Raspberry Pis or Beagle Bones. Uh, one of the other things I'm excited about is the Open Hardware Group, um, which is a nonprofit um, formed by a couple of different country, companies. They're creating this um, uh, board called the, uh, creating this chip called the Core V SOC, and it's gonna be very similar to an NXP IMX. So if you've done embedded Linux work before, uh, NXP, formerly Freescale, is very common with uh, IMX6 or IMX8. Um, and this is essentially that chip, but with a RISC-V core instead of an ARM core. Um, so they're hoping to tape out, which means um, send to fab the test chip in the second half of this year. So maybe next year we'll see boards come out with this um, processor on it. And this is the sort of chip that I think is needed for us to be able to do something like you know, make a BeagleBone or Raspberry Pi type board with uh, RISC-V. So one of the things I'm very interested in is making a board that's $100 or less, that's capable of running Linux. Um, we can't quite do that now because we don't have a chip yet, but um, I'm hoping to once the chip like that open hardware group, um, Core V comes out that 
uh, we could put together an open hardware board um, with that system on chip. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, please get in touch with me. Um, you know, I'm thinking of maybe setting up a mailing list or something like that and see what we can um, get going here. Uh, however, we don't necessarily have to just wait for um, ASICs uh, chips to come out because we can also use something called FPGAs. So FPGAs are a very large topic. Um, they stand for field programmable gate arrays. Um, one of a uh, great talk from last year um, was from Megan Wax of Sci-5. So you can check this out. It was from the Hackaday Super Conference um, and it goes into RISC-V and also FPGAs. And this is a slide from it um, that I think is a good, good kind of quick explanation of what an FPGA is. So you can think of an FPGA or a field programmable gate array as a big C of gates um, in, inside a chip. So normally inside a chip, you have like specific functionality, specific functions dedicated to different parts of the chip. An FPGA is just a bunch of, it's a C of essentially logic gates that we can then reprogram to uh, achieve any sort of digital logic that we design, including even a processor. So we can have something called a soft core which is a processor core that we load into the FPGA. So I'm gonna be talking about um, solutions where we, we um, design a RISC-V processor and then we load it into the FPGA and we consider that to be a soft core instead of a hard core, which is like um, designed in gates on silicon. This is uh, basically, you can think of it as uh, a sea of gates that we can take and then uh, through software, um, configure it to be whatever sort of um, hardware that we want it to be. Now, traditionally with FPGAs, um, you have to download these really giant proprietary IDEs. Um, like the one from Xilinx is like 40 gigabytes for even the smallest installation and it's proprietary software. So in the last couple of years, it was really exciting to see um, open source tool chains to come to some of these FPGAs. Um, and in the FPGA world, um, kind of a, uh, something that's similar to when you compile a program is instead of compiling um, your source code, you then um, do something called synthesis. Um, so you have something called the hardware description language, which is basically a text description of what you want the hardware to do. And examples of this is Verilog or VHDL are the languages that you use to define the hardware. And then you run it through a synthesis process, process that then produces uh, Kind of a gate level design of, of how that logic is implemented. Um, and one of the first tools that was produced was from a person named Claire Wolf created a uh, tool called Yosis that allows us to do um, synthesis with open source tools. And then uh, there's another set of tools um, for place and route. So using all these things together, we can go from our, our text description of the hardware, our Verilog, all the way to the bitstream which is the actual like ones and zeros that get loaded onto the FPGA, all with open source tools. So this was kind of a big revelation when this came out. It was for a rather small FPGA from a company called Lattice called the ICE40. Um, so there was a lot of nifty things you could do with this, but it's not quite big enough to have a soft core that's capable of running Linux. However, one of the bigger Lattice parts called the ECP5 later on, there was an open source project called Project Trellis that came along and allowed uh, you to use an open source flow with this part as well. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about a project in a little bit where we use that. Um, however, the biggest, the biggest FPGAs out there and the ones that are most common in industry are Xilinx. Um, and there is even an effort now that's close to being done called Project X-Ray that's going to allow you to have an open source flow for these larger Xilinx parts. I think things will get really interesting once we have these open source tools for um, some of these larger Xilinx parts. Uh, if you wanna learn more about FPGAs, I talk more about um, kind of the basics of FPGAs and these open source tool chains in this Hackspace column that I wrote recently. You can download it for free at that URL. Um, and then specifically, I wanna talk about the experience that I had with myself and a couple other people um, at this conference uh, at the end of last year. Um, so if you've heard of the website called Hackaday, they post like a lot of cool hardware projects that people around the world have made um, every day. And then every year in November, they have a conference in Los Angeles um, where people get together and do talks and workshops. And they usually have a cool hardware badge. So this ba the badge this year had, a, um, had that ECP5 FPGA in it. Um, 
which you know I mentioned the C of gates before. Um, so this one has 45,000 logic elements that you can program to implement your design. So just to give you a, a sense of how many gates are in there in the FPGA that we can play with, this one has about 45,000. And it, it kind of has this Game Boy form factor. So the idea here was um, it came, what it came with was some different games you could play. And then it had a little graphics engine that you could program and see to display your name or do little animations and graphics and things like that. And it was super fun. And there was several different workshops that taught you how to do things in Verilog and how to do graphics programming in C. Um, but a group of us were like, that that was nice, that's neat. But what we really want is we want to run Linux on the badge, right? Because why wouldn't you want to put Linux on anything that you could? Um, so myself and a couple other people, uh, Michael Welling, um, Tim Ansel, uh, Sean Cross, and Jacob, we got together and hacked on it for a couple of days. And in the end, we were able to get Linux running on the badge. And uh, the first attempt was to use the built-in RAM, which was only 16 megabytes. Uh, and we weren't successful with that, but thankfully, especially, you know, it's a hardware hacking conference. So Jacob, um, before the conference, saw the design of the badge and was like, hey, I'll make an add-in board that has 32 megabytes of DRAM. And that turned out to be very critical because we needed uh, the SD RAM to build front Linux. Um, so he, we were like, oh, it would work if we only had DRAM. And he's like, well, I made this board. Uh, maybe this will work. And we're like, ooh, perfect. Uh, you can see on the back here are the badge. Um, so this is what the front looks like. But then the back had this connector. And the idea here was you'd have cartridges, kind of like a Game Boy had. So this cartridge adds 32 megabytes of SD RAM. And what we're going to do with this FPGA on the badge is load in a soft RISC-V core that can run Linux. Um, and I mentioned that sea of gates. Um, and I thought this was really cool. A uh, great person on Twitter that's always um, tweeting about open source tools and FPGAs um, at EcoTC um, has a cool image here. What does it look like when we take that sea of gates and configure it to be a, a soft core, a soft RISC-V core? Um, and this is kind of a macro view. If you imagine zooming out and seeing all those thousands of gates wired up, um, just to give you an idea of, of what does it look like at a macro level. But specifically, how did we create this uh, soft RISC-V core that got loaded into the Hackaday badge so we could run Linux on it? Well, we actually used Python to do that. Um, so Tim Ansel, uh, who was by Mithro, he was one of the people there at the Hackaday Super Conference. Um, and when we were talking about, oh, it'd be cool to run Linux, um, he, along with Sean, uh, suggested using this framework that uses Python. Um, and uh, Tim has a longer talk where he goes into why Python is great for creating hardware. Um, and his um, justification is that Python's a powerful language and a productive language. I, I, remember I use Python a lot, and I would agree with that. Um, and we can actually use that to generate the hardware description language like Verilog that you would normally use in chip design. Specifically, we use this framework called MeGen. So MeGen is a Python framework that allows us to um, easily generate a bunch of Verilog. So instead of having to write in this Verilog language, we instead just use Python and that produces the Verilog that then goes into the synthesis tool that produces the design that goes into the FPGA. So Python's not running on the FPGA, but we're using Python to create hardware description language that will then produce the gate configuration that goes into the FPGA. Um, so this is just a quick little example from his talk about what does it look like to have a, you know, a little hello world LED blinker in MeGen. Um, if you've done any sort of um, digital design before with Verilog or, or VHDL, um, you'll probably see some of the similar patterns here. Um, so this is to give you a flavor of what it looks like to do a hardware design in Python. I can't go too much into it in this talk because we don't have that much time, um, but there's a great uh, tutorial called um, FPGA 101 and the link there is to the GitHub repo with it. Um, and it's both a combination of slides and little tutorials um, that teach you how to do uh, um, use MeGen. Um, and to give you a kind of example here, I was talking about VHDL, both Verilog and VHDL are usually used to do chip design. Um, so on the left there is VHDL um, of basically defining a flip-flop, uh, which is a very uh, basic digital circuit. And then on the right-hand side is the implementation in MeGen. 
um, which is that Python framework. So it's basically a, a alternative hardware description language based on Python. And what we used to get Linux running on the Hackaday badge was something that's built up on top of MeGen called Lidex. So Lidex actually allows us to um, create a whole system on chip um, with all the different parts that we need in there um, based with this Python MeGen language. So Lidex gives us the um, cores and the controllers that we need for building a full system. You can find out more on the um, GitHub there for Lidex. And here's a nice little overview of what Lidex is. So uh, Lidex, we have the, uh, we're writing Python code in this um, MeGen framework. Uh, and then we also have different peripherals that we can pull in from the Lidex course ecosystem. So things like Ethernet controller, SATA controller, which we don't have on this badge, but we do have DRAM. So we don't have to write our own DRAM controller. We can use the light DRAM controller. Um, and there's fancier FPGA boards that have things like Ethernet and SADA and PCI Express. And for those boards, you, you can um, use these other um, modules from LightX. Here's kind of a, a closer up, a picture of this ASCII diagram. Um, so we have our FPGA tool chain, like the open source tool chains I was talking about before, like Project Ice Storm, or in the case of this FPGA, Project Trellis. And then we have MeGen, which is that Python framework. And then we have the implementation of different cores, uh, like the DRAM controller from LightX. And that all gets pulled together along with the definition of our board um, into the design that actually gets loaded onto the FPGA. However, we were, we were very much aided in the fact that there was already this project called Linux on LightX Vex Risk V. So that's kind of a mouthful. Uh, Vex Risk V is a 32 bit uh, Linux capable uh, Risk V implementation. So this is a um, open source implementation of the RISC-V instruction set um, at 32 bits, and it's capable of running Linux. Um, and then this project takes that core implementation along with things from LightX, like Light DRAM, and allows you to produce a system that is a full system on chip that can run Linux, and then load that onto an FPGA. So here's an example of what it looks like um, uh, having uh, Linux on LightX Vex Risk boot up on an FPGA board. And here's an example of it Linux running on the um, uh, Hackaday badge. Uh, so in this case, I have a uh, serial port wired up to my laptop from the badge. Um, and I'm seeing the output there of the serial port on the badge. So we have the uh, Linux on LightX Vex Risk on the ECP5 FPGA in the Hackaday badge. And it boots up uh, and then it uh, loads the kernel, loads the root file system. And then we can interact with it through the serial port in the terminal emulator on my laptop. So after we got back from the conference, uh, it seemed like a good idea to try and upstream the work that we did. Um, so if you're interested um, in, in seeing the files that we had to change to make this possible, you can go look at this pull request here. Um, well, you probably don't have the Hackaday badge because it was only made for the people at the conference. Um, this is kind of gives a good overview of what does it look like to add support for a new board in LIDEX. And to give you a flavor here of what the, um, the Python code looks like, this is the file where we defined um, the pin constraints. So this is essentially um, for all the different um, uh, hardware ports on the badge, how do those map back to pins on the FPGA chip? Um, so that's what's described in this file. Um, and I think, again, uh, for me as a Python programmer, not someone with a chip design background, this is much more readable and understandable to me than uh, having to look at Verilog or VHDL. It also leverages the nice object-oriented nature of Python. Uh, so, you know, you don't have to understand what all these things mean, but you can see here we're, we're um, in, our, in our board, in the definition for the Hackaday badge, we're pulling in things like uh, LIDEX, you know, uh, SD RAM, uh, LIDEX, um, you know, clocks and stuff like that. So we're able to pull in these modules that were already implemented and just bring it in for our board and then just change the little things that are specific to our board and not have to re-implement everything on our own. Uh, and just to give you an example here of what does it look like um, to define a new uh, board in uh, Linux and LIDEX Vex Risk. So 
the way we did this is we took an existing board um, called the ULX 3S, which is from a hackerspace in Croatia uh, called Radiona. And they already had a board with the same FPGA, the ECP5. So we took, and they were already in Linux on LightX Facts Risk. So we just took that board and we changed some of the um, specifics um, to make it work with our Hackaday badge. Um, and this, this defines here, you can see um, how we're going to then load the um, bitstream onto the FPGA. We use a utility called BFU Util. Uh, and then for our um, badge, we're very simple. We only have serial. Um, so other boards, if you look in this file, you'll see some of them have Ethernet, some of them have PCI Express. So you can have a lot more if your board has more peripherals. We unfortunately only had serial on this one. Uh, so I think another way to illustrate the nice object-oriented nature of this and why it's easy to make it, to extend it to new hardware or new badges is we had a SDRAM chip on this board, the one that Jacob put on the expansion board. Um, and that was not already in uh, the light DRAM module. So this is the DRAM controller that we are using for um, our project. Um, so the only code we had to use was just extending the SDRAM module class and then just adding in the specific um, timing information and structure for our chip. So we can just go pull up the data sheet for this chip, um, look in the table to see what the different timing information is, and just plug that in there. So rather than having to write our own DRAM controller in Verilog or something like that, we can just take like DRAM and just extend it and just put in the information that's specific to our hardware that we have on our badge. However, at, we did get Linux booting and running, but it was taking 300 seconds which is not fun, way too long, right? Uh, so this was a pretty neat like open source moment, I thought. So I opened up a GitHub issue and uh, I said, hey, you know, it's taking a really long time to boot, it's taking like 300 seconds. And um, Enjoy Digital is their username, um, name is uh, Florent. Uh, he's the person that um, created Lidex. Uh, he, uh, within like an hour or something, uh, gave me a patch that made it run 10 times faster. Um, and if you've not used this utility before, ASCII Cinema is a really fun thing that allows you to record your screen so other people can play it back. So when I created the GitHub issue, I showed them, well, what does it look like when it boots up in the terminal? Uh, and then I can also put it up there for other people to see. So it's kind of a neat, uh, neat trick if you've not seen uh, ASCII Cinema before. And I won't play this here, but this shows what it looks like to boot up Linux on the badge. Um, and then we, uh, yeah, so I was saying it sped it up by 10 seconds. And then here's a look at the uh, GitHub issue that I opened up. And to give you a little bit more sense of the Python code involved in um, LightX, here's an example of how uh, Florent was able to um, make it go a lot faster. So one of the issues with this badge was we were using an 8-bit wide DRAM, which means that it can only grab 8 bits at a time, which is not super efficient. Um, uh, normally you'd have like DDR memory that would be like 16 bit wide. So one of the reasons this was going so slow, it was going to have, it was accessing memory uh, very frequently. So every eight bits, every byte would have to go and, and access that from memory. So um, one of the optimizations was um, Florent, Enjoy Digital. He made the um, L2 cache wider so it could fit more in there. Uh, there were some other things that he did as well, but I think this is kind of a neat thing here. For one, if this was Verilog and I looked at the diff, I don't know if I'd be able to make sense of it. I'm not a very experienced with Verilog. Um, with the Python code, you know, even though I don't know the too much about the implementation details of this DRAM controller, I can look at this diff and kind of make a bit of sense of it. So I think that's kind of a, a nice aspect of um, MeGen, which is that Python-based language in LightX, which is built upon MeGen, uh, I think makes it a little bit more accessible to people from a software background. And then you'll notice we have an LCD on the, the Hackaday badge. And it took us a long time to get it working, but Greg Davil, who's an awesome hardware hacker in Australia, who was also at the Super Conference, um, about a, maybe a month ago, he finally got it working with the screen. So he used another piece of uh, a LightX called Light Video to basically create a VGA terminal with the screen so we can see Linux booting up on there now. Uh, and I don't, I don't think you can see me myself, but um, I also have the badge here with me and it's um, doing, doing the same little movie there that you can watch on, uh, on Twitter if you go to that um, URL. So this is the Hackaday badge. It had the ECP5 FPGA in it. 
Um, it is also open source hardware, so you can get the schematics and the board layout and the build materials. However, if you wanted one, you'd have to build your own because it was only made for the people at the conference or find someone that went who's willing to give you their badge. Um, but that's not really a sustainable thing. So what are some open source boards that you can um, either build or get um, that can run Linux? So um, David Shaw is the person that originally did the open source tool chain for the ECP5 called Project Trellis. And he created this like mega board um, that has like super cool things like gigabit ethernet and PCI Express and uh, several gigabytes of DDR memory. Um, this is not a board that you can buy, but the plans are out there to make it. Um, probably not super practical, but if you wanted like the, the highest end board, this would be the one that you would want to build. However, if you don't want to like build the hardware because it's usually pretty expensive to buy things in low quantity, um, there are two options now. So uh, Greg, who I mentioned before, he has this really cool board called the Orange Crab, and it's in this small form factor called the Adafruit Feather form factor which is quite popular for from like the maker world that's working with microcontrollers. And you can get a lot of expansion boards called feather wings that you can add on to this form factor. Um, so this is a has an ECP5 FPGA. It also has 120 megabits of DDR memory, which means it's it's much more than what we have in this Hackaday badge, and it's also much faster. So this is a great platform for running Linux and LightX Vexris. So if you wanted to run uh, Linux on a RISC-V soft core in an FPGA, this is a really good way of doing that. Um, Greg just started a campaign on group gets. Um, so if you want to get one, you can go to that group gets URL and sign up there to, to buy one. And it, it also does run Linux. Um, we were at uh, the Chaos Computer Congress back in December and someone was like, hey, it'd be cool if Linux ran on it. And Greg, within a couple hours working with Tim was able to get Linux to boot up on it. Um, so it's a great platform if you're looking to run Linux on an FPGA with RISC-V. Uh, the other uh, great board is from a hackerspace in Croatia called Radiona. So they have this board also with the F, also with the F, sorry, also with the ECP5 FPGA, um, and they have a couple of different versions with different features. You can also see there on the board it has a lot of um, additional peripherals, so it looks like it'd be something good, especially for doing workshops and things like that. Now this is not something that'll run Linux, but if you just wanted to get into learning FPGAs. The FOMU board, um, which is a project from Tim Ansel uh, and Sean Cross, who, I, who were also on team uh, Linux on badge at the Hackaday conference, uh, they created this uh, small board that fits inside your USB port. The idea here is it teaches you the basics of FPGAs. Um, and it teaches you uh, in the context of MicroPython, Verilog, and then also with LIDEX. Um, so it kind of takes you through these different environments, um, showing you how to blink an LED in each of those different environments. Um, so this is a great board to get if you want to get started. Um, and then you can always have your FPGA with you wherever you go. Um, it won't run Linux, but it'll, it'll get you up to speed because in some ways it's a little bit better to learn the basics of FPGAs with something simpler before you jump into the world of running Linux on a full RISC-V processor. Uh, the slides for this talk with all the links are at that URL there on GitHub. Um, I also gave a uh, talk back at KS Communications Congress um, that goes into kind of some other ARM-based open source hardware boards that run Linux, um, so that might also be of interest. And I'm PDP7 on Twitter, uh, and that's my email address, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Wow, thanks. That was quite a deep dive. Thank you <laughs> very much for that. Uh, so we do have uh, some questions. Uh, let's see. So the first one is, do I remember correctly that your hardware has been in space? I, uh, maybe they're referring to the BeagleBone. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> I don't know if there's any RISC-V in space. I'm, I'm sure there will be. I, um, I'm, it's just a matter of time. There's probably also, I would imagine, some CubeSats with RISC-V microcontrollers. So I'm not sure about that. If they were talking about the BeagleBone, which is a little open hardware board I'm involved with, um, there are BeagleBones in space um, that have been deployed on CubeSats. Okay. Then the second one is, when working with FPGAs, are there specific licenses or do you use GPL, LGPL? How does the, this translate into soft hardware? Um, so one of the things that I thought was 
interesting that um, when I was at FOSDEM, um, I hung out in like the um, risk five room in the EDA room. And one of the things I learned is in this world of chip design, uh, permissive license are much more popular. Um, so when I was talking about those open source implementations of risk five, like uh, Rocket and Boom from Berkeley and uh, um, the Risky and Arian from ETH Zurich, those are all permissively licensed. Um, and I believe in the chip industry, it's quite common for for if there's going to be open IP that they want it to be permissively licensed. There are also some people in the chip design world um, that believe more strongly in reciprocal licenses like GPL, though there are not, I don't think there's really any projects right now that are, there's not too many projects right now that are using reciprocal licenses. So I would say in the in the open source chip design world, um, permissives for, permissive licenses seem to be much more popular. Mm -hmm. With FPGAs, um, the, the software typically was proprietary, um, this like from Altera or now Intel in uh, Xilinx. Uh, they also would offer different cores that you could use um, and those would have different licenses, um, essentially like proprietary implementations that you could use on their chips. Um, but a lot of this is being replaced with the free software tool chains I was talking about and then also projects that are doing open source implementation. So um, like LightX is open source, permissively licensed, so is MeGen. So, um, and hopefully with things like LibreCores from FOSSI, we'll start to see a more uh, broader ecosystem of open source um, IP. By the way, if you look at chip design, people say IP all the time. IP is not IP address, it's for intellectual property, which is also kind of a weird thing to say. What they really mean when they say IP is they mean like a, a block or a module in a design. So like the Ethernet controller, the DRAM controller would be, you know, your Ethernet IP. Uh, I also heard someone say, basically, hardware designers were saying IP, would they surely be saying library? <laughs> okay. Then the next question. Uh... When developing uh, Risk V, do you need to use any proprietary software? Um, it, it it depends on your workflow. Um, so with with chip design, um, uh, so implementing like so the Risk V is an instruction set um, specification. So implement that instruction set. Um, the, typically, you'd be using a proprietary flow. Um, so you know, only recently. Has, is there kind of some alternatives to designing, um, doing chip design with um, open source flows? Um, so typically you'd be using software from companies like Cadence or Mentor or Synopsys to do the synthesis, to do the place and route um, for making chips. Um, there are now um, from some academic projects, one is called Open Roads, um, which is has DARPA funding and it's with the University of Washington, I think, and also University of California, San Diego. Essentially, they're trying to create this flow um, where it's completely open source, um, but almost everything currently being done is with proprietary tools. I see. Okay, the next question is, do you know about the European Processor Initiative, EPI? Yeah, I've, I learned of that from um, watching some of these um, uh, videos at the RISC-V um, Foundation events and also the FASI events. Um, so this is a really neat thing um, that's being led by the EU, which is basically providing funding for um, open source processor um, design projects. So um, universities like ETH Zurich are involved in this and, and several different companies as well. So I think this is exciting and um, there's also um, uh, initiatives like this in other countries as well. Um, India has one called the Shatki, uh, Shatki project as well. So it's really cool to see, um, you know, things like the EU and other countries getting involved in trying to uh, generate open source chip design. Yeah, I agree. Okay, and then we have the last question here. In your opinion, what is stopping Risk Five risk from becoming mainstream yet? I think it's. Um, I think. Partly it's just, it takes time. Um, so uh, it's only kind of jumped out into industry in, in the last couple of years. So it was something that was an academic project for a long time. Um, and now it's being embraced by companies like uh, Western Digital and NVIDIA. Um, 
and they're in the process of doing product design based on it. But um, I think it'll it'll take a little while before we see it um, kind of in everything. Now, places where it seems to be quite popular right now are people that are doing microcontrollers um, and also people that are doing like kind of higher end things like um, supercomputers and stuff like that. I've been seeing some research in that. Uh, I think the th kind of thing we're missing right now is somewhere in the middle, like these uh, system on chips that would go into a smartphone or a single board computer. Uh, and I think it's just gonna take time. One of the reasons being is um, with FPGAs, there's not this huge risk. You can just design a system and load it onto FPGA. But when designing chips, um, being able to verify your design and make sure that's gonna work. So to get a chip made, you have to get these um, masks made up for lithography and they're very expensive. So when they say tape out a chip, they're talking about um, doing these masks and sending them to the fab. Uh, and that's very expensive. And if you get it wrong, you have to do it all over again. You'll lose millions of dollars. For these newer processes, like you know, 10 nanometers, these, these super high-end Intel chips and ARM chips, it can be like tens of millions of dollars for the mass set. Um, so one of the things that's kind of holding back some of these um, open source implementations, we need ways to verify that things work before they go to fab. Um, and one of the groups that specifically is focusing on this is the OpenHW group. And they're the ones that are looking to have this RISC five SOC at the end of this year. Uh, if you check out OpenHW Group, they have a lot of information about how they're trying to leverage um, things like Google Cloud to do um, design verification. So I would say the biggest thing that's holding back um, open source chip design from being out there in the wild more so is the ability to verify um, uh, the open source um, designs before you go to fab with them. Uh, and I think it also just takes time. Um, the cool thing is the software ecosystem is, is there. Like there's good support in Linux now, there's support in GCC and in, in Clang. So uh, we can do a lot with QEMU, we can do a lot with FPGAs and then essentially having chips that are available in volume um, in the market is just gonna take a little bit of time. But by the time we get a chip to do like a Siegel board computer with, um, the, the software support's already there. So, uh, you know, uh, you can boot up Debian, you can boot up uh, Fedora right now. So it's just gonna take a little bit more time, I think probably a couple of years before we have more powerful, more uh, widely available um, chips that are implementing RISC-V. Great. We're running almost out of time, but we have two more qu oh, quick questions. Okay. So has writing with MyGen any downsides as opposed to pure Verilog? Um, it, it could just, it, Kind of, I would say, depends a lot on the people you're working with. So um, system Verilog is something that's quite popular in industry. So I would say one downside to, to using MeGen might be, well, if you're if you're um, working with other hardware designers, they're probably familiar with Verilog or system Verilog. So, so that's one consideration. Though I think the cool thing about MeGen is it's gonna allow us to get, turn more software engineers into hardware designers. Um, so I think that's one of the, the upsides to it. Um, you know, so the downside to MeGen is it's it's kind of a new thing. Um, most hardware designers are using Verilog or VHDL or system Verilog. So um, that's kind of the trade off there. But I, the cool thing here is we could turn more software engineers into, into chip designers with something like MeGen. I see, okay. Okay, and the last one, Look, looking at your crystal ball, when we'll be using RISC-V in our desktop PCs? Yeah, uh, I think that's a tough one. And that goes back to what I was talking about with, with um, making chips is our desktop PCs are, are using really high-end technology. So really small, um, you know, 18 nanometer, 10 nanometer. And to produce mass for these processes is super expensive. Um, so it really takes a company to invest a lot of time and money into the verification and also like the just market justification. So um, I think it'll come um, eventually, but I, it's going to take a while before we see companies producing, you know, something like a Core i7 with with RISC-V because it's a it's a really large bet for them. Like that mass would probably be tens of millions of dollars. So um, it's just it's a it's a pretty large bet for a company to make. Um, you know, like we've seen with ARM, you know, in the server market, it's it's taking a long time for that to happen. Uh, but I think it will happen, and I think. Uh, in countries like China, there's a huge motivation to move away from proprietary instruction sets like Intel and ARM. Uh, 
and to have more control over their own technology. So I think it'll come, but it'll probably take probably take some time. Maybe FOSS uh, 2025, FOSS <laughs> North 2025, maybe we'll have a just five uh, laptop or something. Okay, great. And then uh, another question, but Anonymous wrote, thanks for the great talk. This was one of the most interesting so far. And I agree. Thank you very much. And with that, I would like to thank our speakers, our sponsors, and all our viewers.